room for one more. A man named Joseph Blackwell came to Philadelphia on a business trip. He stayed with a friend in the big house they owned outside the city. That night, they had a good time visiting, but when Blackwell went to bed, he tossed and turned and couldn't sleep. Sometimes during the night he heard the car turn into the driveway. He went to the window to see who was arriving at such a late hour. In the moonlight, he saw long, black hairs filled with people. The driver of the hearse looked up at him. When Blackwell saw his queer, hideous face, he shuddered. The driver called to him. There's a room for one more. Then he waited for one minute or two, and he drove off. In the morning, Blackwell told his friend what had happened. You're dreaming, they said. I must have been, he said, but it didn't seem like a dream. After breakfast, he went into Philadelphia. He spent the day hike above the city in one of the new office building there. Late in the afternoon, he was waiting for an elevator to take him back down to the street. But when it arrived, it was very crowded. One of the passengers looked out and called to him. There is a room for one more, he said. It was the driver of the hears. No thanks, said Blackwell. I'll get the next one. The door closed and the elevator started down. There was shirking and screaming, then the sound of crash. The elevator had fallen to the bottom of the shaft. Everyone aboard was killed. The Wendigo A wealthy man wanted to go hunting in a part of northern Canada where few people had ever hunted. He traveled to the trading post and tried to find a guide to take him, but no one would do it. It was too dangerous, they said. Finally, he found an Indian who needed money badly, and he agreed to take him. The Indian's name was Defago. They met came in the snow near a large frozen lake. For three days they hunted, but they had nothing to show for it. The third night, a wood storm came up. They lay in their tent listening to the wind howling and the trees sweeping back and forth. Tan flap. When he saw started him, there wasn't a breath of air, steering, and the tree were standing perfectly still. Yet he could hear the wind howling, and the more he listened, the more it sounded as if it were calling the Fago's name. The Fago, it called. The Fago. I must be losing my mind, the hunter thought. But the Fago had gotten out of his sleeping bag. He was huddled in the corner of the tent, his head buried in his arm. What's this all about? the hunter asked. It's nothing, the Fago said. But the wind continued to call to him, and the Fago became more tense and more restless. The Fago, it's called. The Fago. Suddenly he jumped to his feet, and he began to run from the tent, but the hunter grabbed him and wrestled him to the ground. You can't leave me out here, the hunter shouted. Then the wind called again, and the Fago broke loose and ran into the darkness. The hunter could hear him screaming as he went. Again and again he cried, Oh, my fair feet, my burning feet on fire! Then his void faded away, and the wind died down. At daybreak, the hunter followed the Fago's track in the snow. They went through the woods, down toward the lake, then out onto the ice. But soon he noticed something strange. The step the Fago had taken got longer and longer. They were so long no human being could have taken them. It was as if something had helped him to hurry away. The hunter followed the track out to the middle of the lake, but they disappeared. At first he thought that the Fago had fallen through the ice, but there was not any hole. Then he thought that something had pulled him off the ice into the sky but that made no sense. As he stood wondering what had happened, the wind picked up again. Soon it was holding as it had the night before. Then he heard Defago's voice. It was coming from up above, and again he heard Defago screaming. My fiery feet, my burning feet. But there was nothing to be seen. Now the hunter wanted to leave that place as fast as he could. He went back to camp and packed. Then he left some food for Defago, and he started out. Weeks later, he reached civilization. 
The following year, he went back to hunt in the area again. He went to the same trading post to look for a guide. The people there could not explain what had happened to the Fagos that night, but they had not seen him since then. Maybe it was the Wendigo, one of them said. And he laughed. It's supposed to come with the wind. It drags you along at great speed until your feet are burned away, and more of you than that. Then it carry you into the sky, and it drop you. It's just crazy story, but that what some of the Indians said. A few days later, the hunter was at the training post again. An Indian came in and sat by the fire. He had a blanket wrapped around him, and he wore his hat so that you couldn't see his face. The hunter thought there was something familiar about him. He walked over and he asked, Are you Defago? The Indian didn't answer. Do you know anything about him? No answer. He began to wonder if something was wrong, if the man needed help but he couldn't see his face. Are you alright? He asked. No answer. To get a look at him, he lifted the Indian's hat. Then he screamed. There was nothing under the hat but a pile of ashes. Something was wrong. One morning, John Sullivan found himself walking along a street downtown. He could not explain what he was doing there, or how he got there, or where he had been earlier. He didn't even know what time it was. He saw a woman walking toward him and stopped her. I'm afraid I forgot my watch, he said, and smiled. Can you tell me the time? When she saw him, she screamed and ran. Then John Sullivan noticed that other people were afraid of him. When they saw him coming, they flattened themselves against a building or ran across the street to stay out of his way. There must be something wrong with me, John Sullivan thought. I'll better go home. He held a taxi but the driver took one look at him and sped away. John Sullivan did not understand what was going on and it scared him. Maybe somebody at home can come and get me, he thought. He found a telephone and called his wife. But a voice he did not recognize answered. Is Mrs. Sullivan there? He asked. The voice said, Mr. Sullivan was killed yesterday in an accident downtown. The Wrecked Fran and Jean went to the same high school, but they met for the first time at the Christmas dance. Fred had come by herself, and so had Jean. Soon Fred decided that Jane was one of the nicest girls he had ever met. They danced together most of the evening. At 11 o'clock, Jane said, I have to leave now. Can you give me a ride? Sure, he said. I've got to go home too. I accidentally drove my car into a tree on my way over here, Jane said. I guess I wasn't paying attention. Fred drove her to the head of Broadway Road. It was in a neighborhood he didn't know very well. Why don't you drop me off here, Jane said. The road up ahead is in really bad condition. I can walk from here. Fred stopped the car and held out some tin, so. Have some, he said. I got it at the dance. Thank you, she said. I'll put it in my hair. And she did. Would you like to go out sometimes to a movie or something? Fred asked. That will be fun, Jane said. After Fred drew off, he realized that he didn't know Jane's last name or her telephone number. I'll go back, he thought. The road can't be that bad. He drove slowly down Brady Road through a thick wood, but there was no sign of Jane. As he came around a curve, he saw the wreckage of a car ahead. It had crashed into a tree and had caught fire. Smoke was still rising from it. As Fred made his way to the car, he could see someone trapped inside, cross against the steering column. It was Jane, and her hair was the Christmas tinsel he had given her. One Sunday Morning Tina always went to the 7 o'clock Sunday morning service at her church. Usually, she heard the clanking of the church bell while she was eating breakfast. But this morning, she heard them while she was still in bed. That means I'm late, she thought. Tina jumped out of bed, quickly dressed, and left without eating or looking at the clock. It was still dark outside, but it usually was dark at this time of year. Tina was the only one on the street. The only sounds she heard were the clatter of her shoes on the pavement. Everybody must already be in church, she thought. Tina took a shortcut through the cemetery. 
then she quietly slipped into the church and found a seat. The service had already begun. When she caught her breath, Tina looked around. The church was filled with people she had never seen before, but the woman next to her did look familiar. Tina smiled at her. It's Josephine Kerr, she thought, but she's dead. She died a month ago. Suddenly, Tina felt uneasy. She looked around again as her eyes began to adjust to the dim light. Tina saw some skeleton in suit and dresses. This is a service for the dead, Tina thought. Everybody here is dead except me. Tina noticed that some of them were staring at her. They looked angry. As she had no business there, Josephine Kerr leaned forward her and whispered, Leave right after the benediction, if you care for your life. When the service came to an end, the minister gave his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, he said. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Tina grabbed her coat and walked quickly toward the door. When she heard footsteps behind her, she glanced back. Several of the dead were coming toward her. Others were getting up to join them. The Lord lift up his countenance to you, the minister went on. Tina was so frightened, she began to run. Out the door she ran, with a pack seeking ghost at her heels. Get out, one of them screamed. Another shouted, you don't belong here, and ripped her coat away. As Tina ran through the cemetery, a third grabbed the hat from her head. Don't come back, it screamed, and shook her arm at her. By the time Tina reached the street, the sun was rising, and the dead had disappeared. Did this really happen? Tina asked herself. Or have I been dreaming? The afternoon, one of Tina's friends bought over her coat and hat, or what was left of them. Then they had been found in the cemetery, torn to shred. The Little Black Dog Billy Mansfield said that a little black dog followed him wherever he went, but he was the only one who saw it, so people thought he was kind of crazy. To drive the dog away, Billy was always hollering at it, throwing rock at it, but the dog always came back. The first time Billy saw the dog was the day he fought Silas Burton. Billy was just a young man then, but the Burton and Billy's family had been founding for years. When Billy saw Silas riding towards him, he went for his gun and Burton went for his, but Billy fired first. He hit Burton in the back, knocking him from his horse. Burton's horse ran away and his gun fell where he couldn't reach it. He lay there on the ground pleading with Billy not to kill him, but Billy killed him anyway. Burton's little black dog was with him when he was shot. The dog kept licking Burton's face and barking and snaring at Billy. In his anger, Billy killed the dog too. There was much law enforcement in those days, so Billy wasn't arrested. But all that night, he heard Burton's dog outside his cabin, scratching at his door and barking to be let in. I am imagining this, Billy said to himself. I shot that dog, it's dead. But the next morning, Billy saw the dog. It was waiting for him outside. From then, and there was not a day when he didn't see it. And there wasn't a night when he didn't hear it scratching on his door, barking to be let in. From then on, Billy was always finding black dog hairs on the sofa, on the floor, in his bed, even in his food, in the house, and the yard stank of dog. That's what Billy said. Whenever somebody told him there was any dog to see, he would say, maybe you don't see it, but I do, and I am not any crazier than you are. Things went on like that for many years. Then one morning in the middle of the winter, the neighbor didn't see any smoke coming out of Billy's chimney. When they went over to check, Billy wasn't there. A day or so later, they found his body laying in the snow in a field back on his, of his cabin. Billy had plenty of enemies, and at first it seemed like somebody might have killed him, but there wasn't a mark on his body, and there were not any front footprints out there except for Billy's. The doctor said Billy probably died of old age, but there was something odd about his death. When the neighbor found Billy, there were black dog hairs on his cloth. There were even a few on his face. It smelled like a dog had been out there, yet no one had seen a dog anywhere. The Bed 
by the window. The three old men shared a room at nursing home. The room had only one window, but for them it was the only link to the real world. Ted Conklin, who had been there the longest, had the bed next to the window. When Ted died, the man in the next bed, George Bess, took his place, and the third man, Richard Green, took George's bed. Despite his illness, George was a cheerful man who spent his days describing the sight he could see from his bed. Pretty girls, a policeman on her back, a traffic jam, a pizza parlor, a fire station, and other scenes of life outside. Richard loved to listen to George, but the more George talked about life outside, the more Richard wanted to see it for himself. Yet he knew that the only when George died would he have his chance. He wanted to look out that window so badly that one day he decided to kill George. He's going to die soon anyway, he told himself. What's the difference will it make? George had a bad heart. If he had an attack during the night and a nurse could not get to him right away, he had pills he could take. He kept them in a bottle on the top of the cabinet between his bed and Richard's. All Richard had to do was knock the bottle to the floor where George could not reach it. A few nights later, George died just as Richard had planned he would. And the next morning, Richard was moved to the bed by the window. Now he will see for himself all the things outside that George had described. After the nurse had left, Richard turned to the window and looked out, but all he could see was a blank brick wall. The Bride The minister's daughter had just gotten married. After the wedding ceremony, there was a great feast, with the music and dancing, on contests and game, even old children's game. When they got to play hide and seek, the bride decided to hide in her grandfather's trunk up in the attic. They will never find me there, she thought. As she was climbing into the trunk, the lid came down and cracked her on the head, and she fell unconscious inside. The lid slammed shut and locked. No one will ever know how long she called for help or how hard she struggled to free herself from that tomb. Everyone in the village searched for her and they looked almost everywhere, but no one thought of looking in the trunk. After a week, her brand new bridegroom and all the others gave up for loss. Years later, a maid went up into the attic looking for something she needed. Maybe it is in the trunk, she thought. She opened it and scream. There lay the missing bride in her wedding dress, but by then she was only a skeleton.